took a deep breath. Good man, good man. Soaring waiting times and plummeting morale. We've now got used to every day is a bad day. The pressure, relentless. Do you have enough money? No, no. We anticipate that we will be £65 million in debt. It's now not just the odd pocket of chaos across Northern Ireland's healthcare system, but an entire entity on life support. We weren't just fighting the cancer, we were fighting a, a broken system. Welcome to Craigavon Area Hospital in Portadown. A&E isn't full. It passed that long ago. And today, 96 patients are waiting for more than 12 hours. But this isn't a Friday night. This is a Tuesday morning. If this is the norm now, what's it like here on a busy day? We're moving people in and out because you've got to keep moving. You've got to keep some new people arriving. Yeah. So it just puts a lot of pressure on our nurses and doctors to move people all the time. We came to this same hospital last year, and it has been a long 12 months. Every available corner of this department is now somewhere to treat a patient, or park a bed, or just keep them waiting. I haven't got any spare beds at the minute. <laughs> so, um, How long have you been looking for that bed for? Yes, from yesterday morning. But as tiring as the odd day here is for patients, the staff are facing exhaustion. This used to be one of the best jobs you could do. Fast-paced, varied, very rewarding. Yeah. Now it's very challenging. It's impossible to do well, and you feel a bit of a failure going home, and that's not that's not a good place to be. Is that how you feel going home? Some days, yeah, because people won't focus on the good job they did for some. They'll say, "Well, I couldn't quite do what I wanted for quite a few other people," so they will feel like a failure. Yes. Today, dozens of patients could be discharged, but because of a lack of social care, there's nowhere to discharge them to. And every aspect of social care is being squeezed too. So this is the sensory room. Uh, we had fundraised uh, for this uh, whenever we moved into the house six years ago. Danny is Claire's middle child, but he's the biggest. Danny has autism, ADHD, severe learning difficulties and a rare genetic disorder meaning his behaviour can be complex. How tricky can his behaviour get? It's... I don't think I can discuss that because I want to... for dignity, for Danny. Yeah. Um, but it's, it's really, really hard and it's heartbreaking. And he doesn't mean to do it. And I know he doesn't mean to do it because he absolutely adores me. There is no let-up for Claire. And by the end of last summer came breaking point. I actually passed out um, and knocked myself out um, and ended up in NE with a concussion. Um, and just so tired. I've never experienced a tiredness like it. Danny is eligible for respite yeah. care. Claire was meant to get a night off last October, but two nights before, due to a lack of resources, it was cancelled. I don't want to dwell on it too much, but yeah. when you get that call that says, actually... Devastated. Absolutely devastated. Um, it actually, you know, it, it breaks your heart because when you, you, you're, you don't know when you're going to get your next break, then you find out a date and then for them to phone and it's taken away, it's... It's cruel. <laughs> it's cruel. Is Claire's story unique? Uh, unfortunately, not by any means. Two thirds of carers in Northern Ireland haven't had access to respite care for more than a year. A large part of the problem for the entire healthcare system here is that for almost two years now, this has been a land with no functioning government. Power sharing collapsed due to issues with the post-Brexit trading arrangement and new budgets cannot be signed off. 2017, there was a major review of the social care system was published that was very widely supported and set out a real roadmap to address some of these challenges and make life better for unpaid carers. But since that review was published, we've had a fully functioning government in place for less than a third of the time. Give the food in, Nanny. This is how Virginia Murphy's family want to remember her, laughing with her grandson, the soul of the family. Now she smiles only in pictures and is a constant reminder that cancer waiting times in Northern Ireland are the worst on record. Did she ever actually get 
treatment for the underlying cancer then? No, she didn't get treatment for the underlying cancer. By the time that they had offered, that they had officially offered her treatment, I think it was just a few weeks before she died, they knew they weren't able to give it to her then and we knew in our hearts that she couldn't take it. She wasn't even fit to, to stand. She was, it's very hard to speak about my mum like this because it's not the way I want to remember her, but she was emaciated. There is an additional problem native to here in Northern Ireland, a problem the healthcare systems in England, Wales and Scotland don't have to contend with, and that is, well, that I'm no longer in Northern Ireland. In those few borderless steps, I'm now in the Republic of Ireland, and here, the healthcare system is experiencing the same problems to the same extent, and salaries can be higher. There is competition for healthcare staff right on Northern Ireland's doorstep. So have you seen staff move to jobs in the Republic? Yes, yes, that's happened and it continues to happen. Let's say by some stroke of miracle, all of a sudden there was a deal struck and we have the executive back up and running this time next week. Do things get sorted straight away? No, they don't. Um, they, that will take some time, but I think uh, it would certainly give us, um, as a system, hope that things could be resolved. Uh, and I think then would help us really plan what the future of NHS um, Northern Ireland would look like. And do you need that big systemic change? We do, yes. Health and Social Care Northern Ireland say the situation in emergency departments is reflective of the current pressures across the entire health and social care system with demand for care outweighing existing capacity, which has been hampered by budgetary pressures and uncertainty over a number of years. For Tom Black, his budgetary pressures are immediate. A GP for 35 years, now funding his costs, like receptionist pay, with overdrafts. And for the first time ever, he's taken on private, paying patients. I'm furious that I've been forced into this at the end of my career. And also a little embarrassed that I'm, to some extent, compromising the values that I've had for all that time. But you know what? I didn't have a choice. They didn't give me a choice. The alternative is this practice closes, my patients suffer and... My would it really have closed if you hadn't have done this? Oh, this contract gets handed back. Within six months, done. Tonight, the Northern Ireland Assembly still isn't sitting. Patients continue to wait. Well, earlier I spoke to the Conservative MP Robert Buckland, who's chair of the Northern Ireland Affairs Committee. With the health service in crisis, thousands of striking public sector workers and no devolved government, I put it to him that it's up to the UK government to do something about it. Well, look, if this uh, current situation carries on and weeks become months again, clearly action from here is going to be necessary. But it's complicated. The UK government is really uh, hedged about by the need to pass legislation every time there's a, a change. And that's what we've been doing today in delaying the election period even further. I, I hope that in the next few weeks we can see a functioning executive because the health service in Northern Ireland is facing the perfect storm. You say that you're hidebound by the problems of legislation. We think of the former Northern Ireland secretary suggesting breaking international law in a very specific and limited way over Brexit. We've just seen a Rwanda bill go through the Commons that is not compatible with international law, but government are pushing ahead anyway. Why can't you break the law to get money to these workers, perhaps you could break it in a specific and limited way here too. I really think that's a facile comparison. You've got it wrong in terms of Rwanda and you've also got it wrong in terms of the comparison you're making. What we're talking about here is the need for the lives of the people of Northern Ireland to be improved. Ultimately, that should be the responsibility of the devolved assembly and executive at Stormont. And it is time now for the institutions to, after 26 years, to be able to bed in, not be so dependent upon personalities and the sort of uh, you know, problems that we see over the last two years and get on delivering for the people of Northern Ireland. You know, we've got a £3.3 billion offer here, which not only deals with the wage question, but also offers, I think, a really uh, positive prospectus for investment in public services in Northern Ireland. But just to be clear, uh, that £3 billion goes nowhere. It doesn't get to those people who have been out marching in their thousands unless the devolved government gets up and running again. So how do you solve that? 
well, the, the, the solution lies in the hands of the politicians of Northern Ireland, which is why today on the floor of the House of Commons there was a, a proper debate. Sir Geoffrey Donaldson spoke powerfully, uh, I thought, in, in a way that I think can lend us some encouragement that clearly there is a, a mindset in the DUP that wants to make things work and wants to see Northern Ireland institutions up and running. We've got to encourage that positive sentiment and see it translated into action. How long do you give the DUP who have been refusing to go back into government? Well, look, I, I think we're coming to a moment now where we do need to know one way or the other. Uh, I don't want to start putting my hobnail boots through negotiations, but I do think that if we don't hear in the next few weeks, then really a different approach is probably going to be needed. I've said before, we can't just go back to traditional direct rule. That has political implications that I think are very serious for everybody across the communities of Northern Ireland. Let's try and make sure that if there isn't a political solution, that the pay claims, that the wage settlements are dealt with, and that at the very least we can give some support to hard-pressed public workers in Northern Ireland. And just finally, Sir Simon Clark, one of your colleagues, says you and your party are at risk of extinction if Mr Sunak isn't replaced. Is he right? Uh, look, Westminster bubble uh, talk by one MP is of very little interest to the lives of the people out there. Rishi Sunak's got a job to do. He's getting on with the hard work of leading this country. He's got a plan. He's dealing with inflation. He's got a clear path forward. I suggest that all colleagues get behind the Prime Minister and that's the best way we can deliver election victory. Robert Buckland, thanks very much for talking to us. Thank you.